Welcome to Miami. The sun and the sea and the sand. They call Miami the magic city. Miami's known for its cultural diversity, given its close proximity to Latin America, but it's also a rapidly expanding metropolis with deep roots in art, music, and everything excess. This unique mashup of coexisting cultures creates an energy that can't be found anywhere else. We'll travel along Biscayne Boulevard, the main artery to the city, stretching north to south as it takes us through neighborhoods as marvelous and as strange as the city itself. Along the way, we catch up with the people who give Miami its vibrancy, from big budget property developers to international DJs, former drug traffickers and street artists, and get to see what makes Miami and its energy so distinct. This is Streets by Vice. To begin to understand the continuous growth of Miami is to understand the city's drug trade history. During the late 1970s and 80s, the Medellin cartel from Colombia, headed by Pablo Escobar, trafficked an estimated $38 billion worth of cocaine into Miami. This massive influx of money changed the face of the city forever. We headed north on Biscayne to the legendary Steve's Pizza to chat with one of Escobar's primary smugglers, Mickey Monday. Mickey's the last surviving cocaine cowboy, a term which refers to the city's drug trade warriors during Miami's Wild West years of the 1980s. After the cocaine empire in Miami fell in the late 80s, Mickey served 10 years in prison for drug trafficking and went on to become an informant for the FBI. Why do you think um, cocaine specifically did so well in Miami? It did so well everywhere. When the rest of the country was going to hell, we had so much money and it started growing. 1978, the economy was getting bit at everywhere and the interest rates were through the roof. The Bahamas cut off fishing for lobster. So you had a whole lot of Cuban fleet here of boats. So they just changed what they were doing. Federal agents in Florida today talked up the nation's largest coke bust ever, more than four tons of cocaine hidden in hollowed out boards of a cargo ship boxcar. And there was no enforcement. I mean, there was, but there was so little compared to the amount that was coming in, you couldn't do it. I mean, it was right in front of everybody. South Florida has a huge coastline. You got all this Everglades out here to the west of us with all these little canals. You can land an airplane there. So it's really just a great landscape for import and export. Yes. How quickly did things around here start changing once uh, drug money started to come in? Even if you weren't in the drug business, you were affected by it. You could be four or five steps away from the actual drug money, but you were getting something out of it. This town became more and more attractive. The town has grown and grown. South Florida is basically a pyramid. You have to keep getting more people so you keep building more. If the building stops, everything stops, and the economy really falls apart. Large influxes of money come into Miami in different ways these days. Soren Wynwood, basically the face of Miami's arts district, it really is the kind of place that shows directly on its walls how much Miami's been changing. It's become a hotbed for international big money buyers and dealers. Last year's Art Basel offered up over $3 billion worth of collectors. Thankfully, the international art market has taken notice of Miami locals. If you walk through Wynwood and take a look at its walls, you'll probably see Dave Ahol Sniffs Glue Anasgasti's work. His art is present throughout the entire city. The next day, we meet up with him at one of his murals where Biscayne intersects the art district. I guess uh, the important one for some people is graffiti versus street art. The way I see it, though, is that, you know, they're two totally different things. Somebody that just paints a fucking wall in broad daylight or whatever, it's not really graffiti, in my opinion. My you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'm not the, the oracle of graffiti, that's for sure. So this is, like, I would consider it a mural. Can you tell me about some of the characters on here? Yeah, that's like, cute. this is a self-portrait of me. This is a character by Don Rymex. It's like some ghetto-ass dude smoking a blunt, getting head. That's one of my characters. She's like a seahorse mermaid type of chick. But Miami's had, like, an ill fucking scene for like a long time. Mm -hmm. There's still a scene in Miami. Me and my brother are first generation. Cubans born in Miami. When you're growing up a certain way, like, you know, you're infused with the fucking shit that they, your parents were infused with, you know what I'm saying? So, like, the Cuban culture is very special. It's very unique. When did well, your parents come over? Uh, well, my dad came around the time of the Peter Pan stuff, and then my mom came a little bit before that. 
Ajo's family were part of a massive exodus of Cuban children to Miami in the 1960s. As Castro's communist revolution began to engulf Cuba, parents became desperate to not give up their parental rights to the newly instated government. Operación Pedro Pan, or Operation Peter Pan, was a mass exodus of 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban minors to the United States between 1960 and 1962. When arriving to Miami, Cubans came to the Freedom Tower, one of Biscayne's oldest and most iconic buildings in order to receive medical services and get the documentation required for their new lives in the United States. We met Eloisa Echazabal, who, like Ajo's family, came to Miami when she was just 13 with her younger sister during Operation Pedro Pan. She walked me through how significant the impact of Cuban immigration has been on the city. The first Pedro Pan children came on the flight on December 26, 1960. As newcomers came to the Freedom Tower, they were sent to camps around Miami. These quickly filled up, and Eloisa and her eight-year-old sister were sent to an orphanage in Buffalo, New York, while waiting to reunite with their parents. When we reunited with our parents here in Miami, we became our parents' parents. We had to, like, help them. We already knew some English, so we had to go with them to translate. If they had to call the telephone company, the electric company, we had to get on the phone and translate for them. We grew up very fast. It's impossible today to imagine what it would be like to have to flee your country, leave your parents, leave your life in order to start new in another place entirely. It's equally impossible to think about the government teaming up with the church to facilitate uh, the escape, safety, and integration of 14,000 children. Cuban Americans account for over 34% of Miami's population, making Cuban culture and the Cuban experience intrinsic to the story of Miami. It's everywhere you look, from the music to the fashion to the food. We're here in Wynwood, just down the street from the Wynwood Walls, to visit La Fama Cafeteria, a local joint that serves some of the finest in sweet and savory hams, fried foods, and coffees that'll knock you on your ass. Hola. How are you? I want una media noche, una colada, y un pastelito con guave queso. So, we all know the classic Cuban sandwich. Cuban bread pressed with a healthy combination of pork, ham, cheese, and special pickles and mustard. But a uh, little less known and possibly more influential is the media noche. Uh, it comes on an egg bun, it's a little sweeter. Uh, personally, I think it's a little more delicious. Gracias. It's um, sweet, it's salty, it's a little sour that you get from the mustard and the pickles. Gracias. This is what's gonna get me through the rest of the day. True Cuban coffee, a colada, a cortadita, is um, some of the strongest that you'll find. Uh, there's a ton of sugar in it. It's, it's brutally dark, it's smoky, it's rich and um, it'll get you caffeinated. Influence from the Caribbean is not just found in the food here, but the music as well. This city is responsible for the global phenomenon known as Miami Bass. Miami Bass helped to further cement the relentless party culture that still exists in the city today. We met up with Walshy Fire, a de facto Miami native and member of the international DJ group Major Lazer. While she works, right. while she works, bro. While she works. These rims are as big as you. Stand up next to these. Stand up next to that, man. What that is? Thirty six? Something? <laughs> that's just ridiculous. So, a little bit about your background yeah. in the Miami bass scene. Um, when did you first encounter it, and how did you find your way into it? Uh, when I first moved to America, everybody in my neighborhood was also a third worlder like myself. You take a, a Dominican person and merengue and how fast that is, and you let like their son do something with that, give it a little bit of a hip hop flavor, add an 808 to it, and then, you know what I'm saying, you start to see the early beginnings of Miami bass. You gotta think about it, man. If it's not ignorantly loud or ignorantly showing off, motherfuckers don't fuck with it here. So it's like, hey, we want some. We want some pussy, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, you listen to songs like that, nowhere else in America would make a song like that, you know what I'm saying? It has to be 
some shit that as soon as you leave Florida, they just won't get it. So we're here at Dogma. This place always looked like this. This is your product of gentrification right here. You know what I'm saying? This was a bad street to be on. Would you ever walk it? No, never. This was Crackhead Central. You know, Biscayne, from 79th to maybe 62nd, it was all motels, nothing but motels that run up and down the street. I think within the next decade, gentrification is gonna be, people are not gonna believe how cleaned up the city is gonna be. One of the most visible examples of this rapid gentrification in Miami is the Vagabond Group's overnight transformation of a series of motels on Biscayne. We're here on Biscayne Boulevard and Northeast 74th Street to talk to Avra Jane, founder of the Vagabond Group and recreator of the Vagabond Hotel. Developers often get cast as the villains in the story that is gentrification. Uh, can you talk to me a bit about Biscayne, which is you know such a transitional uh, avenue for uh, uh, Miami? What is gentrification? Change is good. Look what happened to Biscayne Boulevard. We came in and we helped change it so that it became, became the safe place that it was. We did the historic restoration. But as a result of that, property prices go up. That creates price pressure on rents and things like that. And people get kicked out. The minute that we started to do something, everybody took notice quickly. And one reason why they took notice quickly is because a lot of people travel up and down Biscayne Boulevard. Biscayne Boulevard was Main Street. It was, in fact, it was the only way to what they call, quote, the magic city. Miami was called the magic city because it happened so quickly overnight, and Biscayne Boulevard was the connection. Growing up, you could not find a motel along here that didn't have a police car or three parked in the driveway. A lot of the motels housed the drugs and the prostitution and yeah. everything, so you, you would see the working girls on the street, no, there's no doubt. We realized that if you took away the place where people were doing those types of businesses, mm -hmm. you would change the neighborhood. Although what Avra is doing is essentially making old Miami new again, rapid new property development in Miami is definitely causing a shift in some populations and neighborhoods. One of those neighborhoods currently feeling the displacing effects of gentrification is Little Haiti, home to nearly four generations of Haitian immigrants. We went to Get Down Barbershop in Little Haiti to meet with our friend Jay Dog, a local entrepreneur and native of Little Haiti. Little Haiti is really getting smaller now. A lot of people sold their property and moved out, raised the taxes on the property. The people can't pay the taxes on it. They have to sell. So then you have these investors and all these other people coming out, coming with sweet deals, but at the tail end, it's not really a sweet deal. You're losing your, the house that you stayed in for so long, and you're really not getting the top value for the house. Can you talk to me a bit about the history of Little Haiti? Haitians first came over here. This is, was one of the places most Haitians migrate, settled in. The immigrant experience is what makes Miami. Along with immigrants comes new traditions. In the case of Little Haiti, it was voodoo. Every um, culture practiced some type of voodoo. But the Haitians, they, you know, they have their own that they worship or do what they do. They call it spiritual cleansing, you know? That's what they call it. And, you know, some people believe in it, some people don't. Say someone like me wanted to get uh, spiritual cleansing, where would I go? Those that do it, they don't talk about it. This man that I know, um, you know, you can get it done with them. And you have an experience that you won't forget. Whatever you need in Miami, you can get done. That's one thing about Miami. The religion of voodoo started in the Caribbean as a way for African slaves to practice their traditional religion under the rule of their French masters, who were trying to impose Christianity onto them. Its modern-day incarnations are rooted in the belief that certain voodoo rituals performed before the Haitian Revolution of 1791 led the slaves to successfully overthrow their French rulers. Voodoo has long been misrepresented in popular Western culture. So after j Dog mentioned he could introduce me to a voodoo priest, I wanted to learn more. We're in Little Haiti. We're about to head over to a botanica to pick out some supplies. Living in Miami, there are botanicas in almost every neighborhood you visit. These brightly colored shops sell folk medicines, religious candles, and other products regarded as magical or alternative medicines. After we gathered our supplies from the botanica, we headed to the priest's house to begin the cleanse. 
The ceremony started off with the priest calling in the spirits to help cleanse me. The tying of a scarf around his waist represented that he had been possessed by the spirit. The spirit then greeted me and began to reveal my luck. So you have a dirty luck on you. To help change my apparent bad luck and provide spiritual protection, he prepared a special bath of powder, oils, and Haitian rum and proceeded to, well, cleanse me. He also insisted on cleansing my entire crew. Uh, just got out of our voodoo ceremony. It involved a bunch of different scents. The rest of us who are going to drive us are probably going to want to drive with the windows down because we smell pretty pungent. I decided to head out for the night to see if my newfound luck really worked. My first stop was over to Miami Beach for drinks with Tara Solomon, known to Miami residents as the queen of the night. Tara helped revolutionize the nightlife scene in Miami, so she talked me through how the city became one of the premier party destinations in the world. Cheers, and you were drinking the Cosmo, which was developed in Miami Beach. Back then, I think we were experimenting with Miami Beach and nightlife, and we really invented the bottle service. It did not exist in other parts of you know, the world, basically, mm -hmm. and also the DJ as a celebrity. And other cities, including Las Vegas, took that concept and ran with it. You know, we're New York's kind of gentler, crazier cousin. Tara's right about Miami's unique nightlife. Ready to experience this for myself, I met up with the reigning queen of nightlife in Miami, Veronica Jessa. Hey! Hey, what's up? Veronica's been hosting some of the wildest parties in Miami for years now. If the music's right, that's really what drives you to like, all right, well, we gotta go because this DJ's playing or this band's playing and we're gonna fucking go. Because there's just so much good music out there. Every night, you could literally go to five different places and uh, the night sometimes does not end. Tonight, Wynwood's where it's at. Dive bars, dance parties, and strip clubs are only a few blocks away from each other. We club hopped from Gramps for their weekly reggae and dance hall night, then to the Electric Pickle for some old school house music, before making our way downtown to Club 11. If you want to keep the party going all night, Club 11 is where you want to be. It's a mega club with a 24-hour liquor license and some of the best exotic entertainment in the country. Despite the rapid growth and constant change, Miami's future looks brighter than ever. The future success of Miami is never forgetting its soul. Miami's always been a city in flux, but it's the unique blend of different communities that give the city its true soul. Biscayne Boulevard and the different neighborhoods it runs through reflect just how diverse and special Miami really is. It's called the Magic City for a reason, and it can be felt in every dance club, painted wall, corner botanica, and accent. <laughs>